Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait till I see David Brooks to tell him we have even more in common. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone because you could take that so many places. I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be here. I was thrilled at the idea of being outside in the tent in the shadow of Monticello, but I had no, I, I made some arrangements. I, I have a very close relationship with God and we had a, a word about the skies. And I said, if you could just arrange for a little rain so I can be inside Monticello. So <laughs> yes, it's all my fault. But thank you. I'm really, I am honored to be here. And I'm especially honored that so many of you are willing to stand to hear me speak. So I won't abuse your, uh, your, the soles of your feet. Um, I will speak for a short while, but I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, when I was asked what I would like to talk about tonight, I, I had, I said off the top of my head that I wanted to talk about race, politics, and democracy. Given the election year that we are now already in the middle in of, it now seems appropriate. But it's also a subject I've been giving a little bit of thought to lately because I recently agreed to write a book on the subject and I have already discovered that it is an ever shifting target, this topic. We see as we stand here tonight, the rise of an African American candidate for president who it appears for the first time has engendered widespread appeal across racial lines. It appears we are headed into another one of those, our periodic national conversations on race. Of course, one version played out right here in Monticello in the conflicted musings of Thomas Jefferson when it came to slavery. But the same subject came around again and again as the nation wrestled with the right to vote and what it meant to be a full citizen. It has occupied us repeatedly as we have used the levers of democracy that our founders envisioned for us, not necessarily for all of us right away, but for most of us, to expand as I walked as I walked to my college classes in Washington, in Boston, when I was a child, child, <laughs> a young person, I realized there was a huge intersection of the rights of association, education, and access to franchise. I'll get back to that in a moment. Because right now in Washington, even as we, as you can tell, debate immigration and border security and racial dispute, it's never far from the center of the disagreement. The debate is never resolved, and I'm here to come to, to posit a unique idea, which is that I don't believe it's good that it necessarily needs to be resolved. So in this presidential campaign year, we have an extraordinary opportunity to witness the intersection of our ideals when it comes to politics and when it comes to race, which will survive. Politics, as always, as at, at, is at its most interesting when it reaches what I call that sandpaper place where change happens. That's when rocks get thrown and power shifts hands. Huge sums of money are usually involved, as you will see again this year. History books must constantly be re rewritten because no one cedes power without a fight. But when change does occur, the rhetoric that accompanies it can often be compelling and rich. Throughout our nation's history, race has often been the backdrop for the most eventful change. Wars have been fought, marches have been led, movements have been nurtured from the pain and the discovery of our evolving debate over civil rights and the politics of difference. I got my first true taste of racial tipping point politics at the very start of my career in the 1970s. I was a novice reporter for the Boston Herald American right out of college. Boston at the time in the 1970s was awash in its own racial drama. The federal courts had demanded that the city's very political school committee fix the city's racially segregated school system and its racially unbalanced education system. The solution at the time seemed reasonable, forced busing. It seemed straightforward. You send white children to black neighborhood schools, and you send black children to white neighborhoods. The idea was to impose balance where it no longer existed. The optimistic reasoning that the resources, teachers, textbooks, and so forth would follow. But history now shows us that busing was, as it turned out, a radical notion, one that struck at the heart of neighborhood identity in cities all over the country, memorably so for me in South Boston, which was highly Irish, and Black Roxbury, which was highly African American. White, white residents of these insular neighborhoods railed, sometimes violently, against the notion that someone was staging an incursion into their neighborhood schools. And black residents 
railed right back. I found out that everywhere I went, it was around me. When I went to, I, my college was in Boston's Fenway neighborhood. There was a high school right next to it. There were often p police out front with tear gas and with riot helmets, and it played out again and again. By the time I worked for the Boston Herald American, I was covering this, I reasoned correctly that they were not paying me enough to cover riots in person. <laughs> The spectacle of a young black woman going to South Boston to say, why did this happen today, somehow didn't appeal to me at that price. So I learned to cover the disturbances by telephone, calling up the headmaster of South Boston High School and using my most neutral white reporter's voice. <laughs> How many chairs were broken in the cafeteria today? It took some years and a more sophisticated understanding of how race and poverty intersect before I began to understand that what I saw in Boston then was not unique to that city. It turned out it was an, another chapter and a power shift that was defined by but not limited to race. By the time I moved to Baltimore a few years later for my next job, the tipping point I had unwittingly been covering in Boston was a little farther along. The majority of the city's residents were black, and the city's leaders were still mostly white. The city's paternalistic mayor, William Donald Schaefer, had revived Baltimore. It turned it into, from a worn out waterfront city into a vision of Disneyland on the harbor with an aquarium, tourists in droves. Twin baseball and football stadiums were poised to sprout on the downtown's southern edge, and there were gleaming condominiums on the drawing boards. No more rundown docks. Schaefer was being hailed all over the country as being a national urban savior. But away from the glittering downtown and away from the condominiums that most convention visitors saw, the picture, as always, was more complicated. Crime was climbing, the schools were sliding, and 20 years later, that slide has not stopped. And it hasn't stopped in spite of the arrival since then of three black mayors and the white progressive mayor. It has not ended because Hairspray became a Broadway hit. It is because, is it because of the failure of politics that the number of rate, that the murder rate in Baltimore continued to climb and continues to climb? Is it because of the challenges of democracy? Or is it because of the intractable inequalities that we have in this country rooted in race? Or is it because we deal so poorly with change, sandpaper change? When I left Boston, to Baltimore to work for the Washington Post, I took my unintentional journalistic road trip through tipping point politics to the Washington suburbs about 40 minutes south on I-95 to Prince George's County. By the time I arrived, which was in 1984, the black population in Prince George's County was just about 50% tipping point. The country's power structure was shifting from mostly white to mostly black, and the resulting friction provided for a memorable foreshadowing of what was about to play out on the national stage. Middle-class black teachers, accountants, doctors, they were all thronging to Prince George's County, which was replacing its farmland with cul-de-sacs and even gated golf communities. As a result, PG, as it was derisively known by people who did not live there, had become the home of the most prosperous population of African Americans in the country. Reverend Jesse Jackson discovered this in 1984 when he decided to run for president, and he discovered it again in 1988. I covered his second campaign, by this time a national reporter for the Washington Post, and for the first time, I was able to witness what happened when sandpaper politics plays out on a national scale. 1988 was different. It was different from Jackson's first 1984 campaign, which was a little more whimsical. 19, in 19, by then, in 1988, white faces had begun to come to his campaign rallies. They had joined the Jackson bandwagon. Jackson himself was making a determined effort to reach beyond his black church base to establish himself as a force to be reckoned with in the broader Democratic Party. When Jackson actually won the Michigan primary that year, white people and some black folk were actually scared. I don't say that, the magazine said it. In 1984, you'll recall when Jackson first flexed his political muscle, the headline in Time Magazine read, what does Jesse really want? Kind of nervous, a little question mark, but you know, they didn't know the answer really. They, were, they suspected it wasn't good. By 1988, however, after he won that Michigan primary, the jet, he, came, he ended up on the cover of Time once again. This time, however, it was his face, and it was the word 
Jesse, exclamation point, question mark. <laughs> Far more alarm this time. I remember during that period talking to the white mayor of Sheboygan, Wisconsin. It was about a week after he'd won the Michigan primary and everybody was starting to think maybe he would win Wisconsin as well. As we sat in the mayor's office, he and I, he anxiously pointed out to me the framed picture on his walls of boxers and politicians and athletes. And he said to my face that some of his best friends were black. <laughs> now this was my first clue that Sheboygan was not to be the great success, the great breakthrough for Jesse Jackson that others thought. In fact, Jackson not only lost a town, he lost the entire state of Wisconsin by a wide margin. I believe the mayor was behind it. Still, I was fascinated to discover as I followed other candidates around the country this year that there was something that other reporters, I believe, were missing. Jackson's supporters were actually the left-wing version of the very same supporters I saw when I traveled the country with Pat Robertson. These voters, I realized, shared much more in common than most race-obsessed observers could actually see. All these people felt disenfranchised, white, black, you name it. Their sense of grievance, the, convic the conviction that no one was speaking to them, it crossed racial lines in ways that only now we are beginning to realize and are now benefiting black candidates. Even then, the ground was shifting. And the way it was shifting provided lessons for anyone who cared to pay attention to the way African Americans and Americans in general were now thinking. Building on the Jackson breakthrough in the political realm and the Cosby and Oprah breakthroughs in the television screen and countless households, it turns out that black politicians were going mainstream. In 1990, L. Douglas Wilder, a Korean War veteran raised in Richmond's segregated schools was elected this Commonwealth 66 governor and the, first na and the nation's first ever chief executive of a state, ever, of an African American. Obviously, there were other chief executives of states, <laughs> the first black one. In 1996, environmentalist and county council member Ron Sims, who marched in civil rights marches, protests with his parents while he was growing up in Spokane, Washington, was appointed King County Executive there. He has since been reelected twice. In 2005, Mark Mallory, a state senator from Cincinnati and the son, the youngest son of a former Ohio House Majority Leader, became that city's first directly elected African mayor ever. All of these candidates and elected officials represent what we are seeing now, which is, I believe to be a truly historic power shift. It's easy to miss change when it happens. There's seldom a lightning strike like we have had here today that illuminates the precise moment of change. But it has now become blazingly clear that we have reached a place that we have not seen before. If you don't think this is extraordinary, consider Colin Powell. He was already 56 years, 58 years old, and a much decorated and admired retired general years before the Iraq War had come along to sully his reputation, when he was lured into a deep and serious flirtation with the presidency in 1995. But even though he decided not to run that year, General Powell readily acknowledged at the time even that even the possibility that he might run had already broken new ground. He said, uh, he had a, gave a very crowded press conference, looked kind of like this room, people standing, hanging from the ceilings to say he wasn't going to run. We showed up anyway. But this is what he said that day. In one generation, we have moved from denying a black man service at a lunch counter to elevating one to the highest military office in the nation and to being a serious contender for the presidency. And that was 12 years ago. But Powell would not have been the first black candidate for president, and Jesse Jackson wasn't either. That distinction belonged to Shirley Chisholm, the tart and bespectacled immigrant's daughter. I'm tart, and I'm an immigrant's daughter, but I'm, I don't wear the glasses so much. But, and I also didn't have it like she had it. In 1968, she was the first African-American woman elected to Congress. She garnered about 5% of the vote when she, when she sought the Democratic nomination in 1972. Jackson followed, grabbing enough attention to earn him a memorable primetime speaking role at the Democratic National Convention in 1984. And in 1988, when he made it all the way to the nominating convention with delegates in tow, he forced party leaders to negotiate with him. Wilder, too, launched his own a border run for the nomination for president in 1992. Many people never noticed that. 
activists like the Reverend Al Sharpton, Lenora Polani, former Senator Carol Mosley Braun, they also tried, but they never achieved Jackson's level of success. The latest generation of black politicians banging their heads against the political glass ceilings take something from the Doug Wilders, the Jesse Jacksons, the Colin Powells. Like ships maneuvering their way through a narrow channel, they are embracing civil rights politics when it helps and moving past it when it does not. Part of that is because much of the language which so defined the earlier movement has utterly changed. It was once critical to integrate lunch counters, as we heard Colin Powell re refer to. But does anyone born after 1970 even know what a lunch counter is anymore? <laughs> Group protest was rooted in the church. Now it finds its home on the internet. Marches are a form of nostalgia or solidarity, not really the form for demand that they once were. And there is still only one African-American senator in the United States Senate, 43 members in the House. But at practically every other level, black politics has been transformed. And I think that's in part because black politicians have been transformed. Increasingly, they are the fruit of a post-civil rights era that has altered the way African-Americans view each other and certainly how African-Americans are viewed by others. The best known example, of course, is Barack Obama, who seems to have exploded on the political scene like a supernova. Others debate his blackness. He does not. Others stress his biracial background. He does not. But then again, he doesn't have to. Barely two years out of the Illinois State House and with two best-selling memoirs under his belt, Obama has mounted a real challenge for the Democratic nomination. Whether he wins or not, his campaign will provide fodder for political scientists for decades to come. And that's in part because the potential for conflict, for sandpaper change, is playing out not just across the predictable black-white divide, it is also playing out within the black community as well, which I think is an important distinction. Former Congressman Floyd Flake, he put it best in a magazine interview in 2002. He was actually being asked about the rising star in Newark, New Jersey, Cory Booker, who's now the mayor. At the time, in 1992, he was running, in 2002, he was running against uh, the entrenched uh, Mayor Sharp James, an old school black politician who played Hardball. And Cory Booker ran that year and lost. He ran four years later and won, but only because James dropped out of the race. This is what Floyd Flake said about that and in general about this change that's underway. The younger guys, he said, are going to have to make their way because what's really most threatening to them is that here is a generation of kids that are not locked up in the struggles of the civil rights era. And the older generation is saying they're not ready because they're not black enough. It's a sad indictment on us as a race. Sandpaper politics. Rocks get thrown, power shifts, and it is no longer defined by the black and white of our shared and collective tortured racial history. So it's going to be a fascinating year in American politics as we see how it plays out and as I continue my little journey. With that, I will thank you and stop and take your questions. Thank you. If you have a question, would you just be sure and speak very loud? If for some reason people in the back can't hear it, I will repeat it on the amplification. Sir. Um, your previous comments about Mr. Obama notwithstanding, as an African American, are you happy that he is the guy that's out front uh, leading this charge at this particular point in time, given the fact it seems to be very easy to post shots at him given his lack of experience. In other words, is there another African American that you would rather see out there? I think I, well, <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to get me in trouble. Yeah. yeah. I don't but think there are any here. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Here's the thing, and the, you're, you're, it, this is the basis for every question I'll answer. I don't really have opinions. You find it hard to imagine, but if I were to form opinions about people or things or issues, then I would be incapable of hearing the other side, even if I formed a personal opinion. That means I would stop listening. And since for what I do for a living, it's so critical that I listen, I try not to now to form an opinion. But I will answer your general question, which is I, I'm just happy anybody is there. 
I think it is such an incredible challenge to run for president and to put yourself up for people to judge you in that way, that if you have the courage <laughs> Oh, it's my clock. OK. Thomas is just saying hello. <laughs> that is so cool. Is, are we at the top of an hour or something? Yeah. Oh, it's 8 o'clock. OK, that's, this is extremely cool. I'm going to retell the story, and I'm going to make it seem like he came down and did it. <laughs> he did. <laughs> no, but I really think that anybody who's willing to step up to the bar and compete and do what it takes, which I just think is crazy to run for president, I, I often ask these candidates, why are you doing this? But I'm glad that they do. I'm glad that someone is willing to put themselves out there, whether it's Barack Obama who's going to do it and throw himself on the, on the fiery pyre, or if it's anyone else. I think it's fine. I think what the exciting things, there's some discussion in this campaign trail. There's so many people out there, and these can't, debates are so crowded. I just love that there are so many choices. And I think Americans are smart enough to be able to, to dig through the choices. And hopefully, these candidates are smart enough to survive the pot shot so they shouldn't be out there. Thank you. You're welcome. Next question. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, we enjoy your show on Sunday. And, uh, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Who would you like to see as a third party candidate? Not sure yet, because I don't assume you're a Republican or a Democrat, okay? Yeah. I think there, there are a lot of options. Um, I, I think, first of all, we don't really know what the shakeout's going to be. But I also think it's possible for people who think of themselves as an independent thing, which, will, which a lot of people do, to have a choice from what I think is a pretty wide array of candidates who are, happen to be aligned with the party, but who are more independent thinking, perhaps. Uh, people pick and choose, I find. Voters pick and choose what they like personally, what they like policy-wise about different candidates. It doesn't necessarily mean it requires a third party to get someone who suits that. But that said, I don't know. I think we talk about it every four years, as if there's a possibility of a third party without, the possi without thinking about what the realities are that requires a successful third party candidate to compete. The last one we saw, a significant one, of course, was Ross Perot, who had a lot of money, but in the end struck away too many people as just out of his mind. <laughs> And so as a result, that pulled people up short on this notion of a third party. That's not always the solution. Uh, sometimes the solution is to look within the party. Sometimes the solution, and some people, as someone mentioned his name, are excited about the potential of Michael Bloomberg. Uh, Michael Bloomberg can lay out his own deficits better than I ever could. So I'm not certain that's going to happen either. But it's worth the stage, July of the year before the election, where it's OK for us to consider every possibility and see who is going to be left standing. Yes, sir. Well, when you consider a possibility, you're, 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 the internet has, has done exactly that. And, and I'd be curious uh, in your Washington contacts to, to get raised. I mean, do, do, the, do the power structure in Washington see that sort of out of control mass as a as a, as a loss of their control, or do they have they figured out that it's uh, that, that which out of control mass are you referring to? The population. I mean, in the old days, and not very long ago, they would they would have, they would plan campaigns and they would they would have things structured. How dare Americans choose to speak instead of letting them all work it out in the back hall? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't know. I can't, I don't think it would be a real mistake to speak in a general way about what Washington thinks or what politics thinks because I don't think that people have figured it out yet. Um, I think, for instance. There are a lot of people who have played by all the rules as they have been laid out in previous campaigns, and they find something like Barack Obama a wild card. They just don't know who these people are he's appealing to. They don't know whether they are real supporters who are going to stick with him throughout, or whether they're just people who are excited by the idea of it and will melt away. Howard Dean, you'll remember, had a lot of excitement attached to his campaign, and for various reasons, they, including the fact that he didn't win, but they melted away. That group did not stay as its own power base within the Democratic Party, party uh, that somebody else could appropriate. The problem with attracting independent voters is they're kind of independent. 
and they'll make up their minds where they're going to go next, and they may not all be to the same person. So I don't, I don't hear, I don't see widespread alarm in inside the Beltway. I love that term, inside the Beltway. There's so many people inside the Beltway who don't care. I have to tell you. <laughs> but who live there. But, um, but no, there, there are a lot of people who do. And I don't see any widespread alarm that things have gotten out of their control. I think it's partly because it's early and partly because I don't think they walk in lockstep quite like that. Yes, sir. By the way, are you hearing okay in the back, the questions? Okay. This is wonderful acoustics. Mm -hmm. And the attempts to restrain it. I think it's a basic part of politics you have to live with for a couple of reasons. One is that the Supreme Court has said that they equate money with speech. That's their final word on this, and they believe that that campaign finance, campaign donations, should be protected as someone's way of expressing themselves. That's one reason. Another reason is, and people, I, I, every time we talk about campaign finance issues or campaign finance, who's raised what money, we always get angry mail from viewers saying, "Why are you talking about money? You're just why don't you talk about substance?" Well. Money is the, is the fuel that allows people to get to the substance. There is no way to be heard unless you can compete in what is an increasingly expensive and technological communications environment. So if, you can't, if you've got the best idea in the world to how to solve health care and you can't find a way to get on the air in, in Iowa or New Hampshire, the way that things are laid out, you're just not going to get your message out. And that's why there's an there, there's a argument equating money with speech. I do think that it's ridiculously expensive, but I don't know whether that's just the way it has to be or not. Um, I don't, I know that John McCain, in part, interestingly, that he is suffering on one hand from people who hate his, his campaign finance limitations, people within his own party, and at the same time can't raise enough money to keep his campaign on the even keel. He seems to be suffering in both, from both directions. But I think that he was speaking to this general, he and Russ Feingold, who came up with this idea, this general idea that money is taking too big a role. It's too much of a definer of who can succeed and who cannot. Um, I, I, I don't know what I th if I think that's true. I do know that that's where we are. And I don't really see it changing anytime soon. Yes, sir. Um, I want some women to speak up I here, was please. I was just thinking that. I, I, I'll I've been thinking that. OK, I acknowledge. Okay, I acknowledge him already, but I'm going to come back to you next, then to you. Okay. I mean, really, women. Go ahead. How much, the internet is going in for the talk now to raise money. How much further do you see that progressing as races go forward in the future? Oh, I think inter the internet's a, a huge, huge source of money. It's really interesting to watch. Of the, I'm going to get the numbers wrong. Of the amount of money that Barack Obama raised, I believe, hmm. Hundred million dollars of it may have come over the internet. Is that right? Does that sound right? There was some amazing amount of money that he raised from people who just clicked, and and a lot of it, and ninety percent of it. I don't know if the number is right, but ninety percent of that money came. It couldn't be a hundred million because he only raised thirty-two, so it's like ten million. So, but but ninety percent of that came from people who gave like twenty-five dollar contributions, which means you can come back. To to those people, back to those people, back to those people. And as a result, you end up with a kind of, if it works that way, which we don't know it does, but if it works that way, you have a pretty deep well of people who are not your normal campaign donators. And I think that that is a whole new thing, which believe me, after they saw those numbers, the other campaigns are trying to figure out how to capitalize on. You know, things like the internet and technology are racing so far ahead of where we thought it was just for every four-year cycle. It's completely different than it was before, and so everyone's trying to figure out what's new. I mean, I believe that in politics, they often fight the last battle. So they're trying to win. You know, in 2004, they were fighting the battle of Florida in the Supreme Court, but that battle was over. They needed to move ahead to wherever the next battle has moved to, and I think that's what people are attempting to do this year with technology. Yes, <laughs> my first what woman. I've noticed is that there are no questions from women and that you are a woman. And I was lucky enough I am, it's true. Be, I was lucky enough to be in an age where the civil rights movement was incredibly important to us and we were able to take part in it. But I was also part of the feminist movement too. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you give a wonderful talk tonight that very comfortably dealt with race. 
you also speak often about being a woman and in a broadcast, a very serious part of the broadcast profession. I talk about it when asked specific questions. It's funny. I, 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 I wanted to write, talk about race tonight, which I seldom do actually, but I talk, want to talk about tonight in part because of where we are. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but the truth of the matter is, I, people ask me, you know, used to ask me this, they don't do it anymore because it's kind of a silly question. Are you a woman first or a black first? And I'm like, what, like I have a choice? <laughs> <laughs> I wish someone had told me. And as it happens, I'm pretty happy being both. It turned out to be, which is a good thing, don't you think, since I didn't have a choice. No, I, I find that in broadcast television, as you know, I started out as a newspaper reporter. It never crossed my mind to go into television. In fact, I thought it was shallow and, and beneath me. Um, and then Tim Russert talked me into coming to work. He kind of dared me to come to work for NBC, and I can always respond to a good dare. So I burned no bridges behind me at the New York Times and crawled across to see if I could try television, which, um, is an interesting and fascinating way of reaching people because you just reach so many more people than are reading in the newspaper. But it's not a long-term solution for my retirement years on the air. It's not a place that is kind to women. It is a place where we are spending a lot more time talking about, I'll get a lot more mail about my jewelry than I'll be, get about what I said, which actually doesn't bother me. I'm kind of proud of my jewelry. But, I, but, but, but still, you have to factor, factor that into your thinking on the air. There's a lot of, it's a visual medium. Um, I remember once years ago when I worked at a newspaper, a woman came in to interview for a job, a young black woman, and she came in with a pearl in one ear and a hoop in the other. And I took her aside and said, you know you, your earrings, you, they don't match. And she said, I know it's my look now. <laughs> it should be said this was not the look in 1982. So I said to her, you shouldn't, you should, she insisted. The only thing my boss said to me after she left was, did you notice her earrings didn't match? <laughs> and my rule, and I tell this to young people all the time, is that it's distracting enough for employers that you're a woman or a black person or anything different than they are. Don't give them something else to focus on. <laughs> and that, to me, is just what you factor into everything you do, the way you carry yourself, the way you dress, the way you speak, the way you interact. It's not whether it's fair or not or whether you're treated equivalently or not. You're not. So you factor that into how you present yourself and don't carry it around on your back like a burden. You're next. Well, since we've established that you're both African American and um, I'm wondering if you have any comment on how we've gotten to what is a pretty remarkable position here in 2007 that we are seriously contemplating the possibility that either race or gender yeah. may break a ceiling that for some of us in our lifetime. We never thought we'd see. And what is it? What is it that has led us to this day? I wonder, as you report around the nation, which which ceiling has the best. You know, I am just as curious about that as you. And ethnicity, Bill Richardson. I mean, I I don't trust yet what people tell pollsters about race and gender. So. I don't know, and, and in fact, pollsters don't trust what people tell pollsters. So they're always trying to peel it away with ever more complicated questions to try to get to people's true biases, essentially. So when someone says to me, yeah, I'd vote for a woman, really? Well, who's the last woman you voted for? I mean, you have to ask more and more questions that put, lay, put reality to it. So part of me wants to hold back from getting too caught up in the notion that barriers are going to fall. On the other hand, there's the deep idealist inside of me which would like to think we are a mature enough nation to pick the best candidate, whether that person happened to be a woman, Latino, uh, black, whatever, half Kenyan, whatever he is. <laughs> you know, he's, a, he's, he's many things, it turns out. I don't know if we're there yet. I'm curious to see. It's one of the great question marks, which I think this, uh, this campaign year um, provides. A friend of mine said to me not long ago, boy, those Democrats really don't want to win, do they? I mean, a black man and a white woman, what were they thinking? <laughs> well, she's a little cynical about that. I'm not as cynical, but I am curious, and I, and I don't know. Can I have a second? Uh, sure, quick. Um, yeah. Yes, he's been traveling around the country. Um, 
I don't have any thoughts on it because I don't know how he means for that to happen. I've heard that he's out there and a couple other people. Unity 08, I think, is the name of it. But I don't, I don't know how he means for that to happen. I do like the ideal, but I, I think that partisanship is a little bit more deeply ingrained for good reasons, not just all bad reasons. There are things which different parties believe differently. And so partisanship isn't always a bad thing. On the other hand, what it ignores is that there are vast areas of agreement, and that's what I think he's speaking to. Yes, now the women are breaking out. <laughs> Men are scared. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. He was a great man. You know, I, I, like many African Americans, have lots of uh, conflicted and, and possibly not fully informed opinions about Thomas Jefferson. My knowledge of him is limited to what, you know, the obvious stuff, but also to what I've seen in documentaries and read in history books. I think that Thomas Jefferson was clearly a gifted genius on so many levels, and he was also a man of his time which means he had deep flaws and blinders on, which made it impossible for him to see what he could not see. I almost don't even know if I want to fully hold him responsible for the, the things he missed and the things he was incapable of addressing because of the times in which he lived. I will tell you one story, which is one of my memories of covering the White House for the New York Times when Bill Clinton was president. Uh, when Ken Burns' documentary on Thomas Jefferson came out, there was a, a viewing at the White House and the president invited, as Bill Clinton would, everybody he could think of, including the descendants of Jefferson who were white and the descendants of Jefferson who were not. And after the screening, uh, there was much milling about in the East Room of the White House and kind of excitement about the historic nature. And as I was talking to President Clinton, he turned and acknowledged a black descendant and turned and acknowledged on the other side a white descendant who immediately fell into fighting in front of us. At which point, over their heads, the president and I looked at each other and thought, <laughs> we extricated ourselves from the conversation. But there I got to see play out in front of my eyes one of the essential conflicts surrounding Jefferson in a way that I didn't anticipate and which a way that I'm, I'm always kind of shocked and surprised and amazed is so violently alive today. Um, but it's good. It means that we're fighting over our history and that we're trying to constantly in the process of trying to redefine it and sharpen it and make it more what it ought to be, which is true to the times and true to, to our, our lives now. Thanks for a tough one. <laughs> yes, sir. Bush? W, huh? Um, how do I see history? I know how he sees history treating himself. I'm serious. When he defends himself now on the war or any other unpopular notion that he is now forced to defend, his answer almost always now is to talk about what historians will say. He references um, George Washington and how people are still rewriting George Washington's history. So he clearly is invested in the notion that his will be rewritten as well and that people will understand that his commitment, and I'm, I'm just speaking in his words here because this is a man who truly believes what he says, which is that his commitment to spreading democracy around the world was one that was misunderstood at the time but was a worthwhile thing to pursue. That's what he sees the history book saying, perhaps long after he's dead. He is, I believe, convinced that he will never get that fair shake while he is still president, certainly, and maybe not even while he's alive to see it. But what he's correct about is history has a way of redeeming people. We saw Richard Nixon in, in part redeemed before he died. So that's possible. What, what will the history books will actually say? I don't know, because one of the interesting things, we were talking about this at the Miller Center today, is what we have available to us now to reconstruct history as it's happening. We had audio tapes, which we can now listen to and go, wow, they curse in the Oval Office. <laughs> we can have all kinds of ways of reconstructing what happened until they stopped taping things wisely for them. But now we have to find other ways of reassembling what the truth was. And, and it's a constant process. I find every new book that comes out about the run-up to war in Iraq gives me an entirely new layer of information that, once again, I didn't have then. And that's, of course, what they call it history. So I think as it continues to be remade, I don't quite 
see the way clear to George W. Bush's redemption as he sees, but it doesn't mean that it's not there buried somewhere. Yes. Um, my question is back to the topic of race. And, you know, in listening to what you had to say and thinking about the process that, for example, South Africa went through, is the time for some kind of conversation around race and reconciliation a 20th century concept, or is it a 21st century? Is it something that we will just get beyond? I don't think we'll get beyond it. It's an interesting question because I do think that you're, in South Africa there was this historic race and truth and reconciliation process in which they went through horrible and painful times contemporaneous with their lifetimes when we're able to gather rooms, talk about it, wrestle it through, bring the perpetrators to speak and admit. Amazing process. Something I can't quite imagine happening here and I don't know whether it's because it's not as quick it's because a lot of people are really invested in the notion that this is an issue we should be passed. Um, I find that a lot of people who support Barack Obama are drawn to him because they think he, I, I should say, I should be accurate about this, white people who are drawn to Barack Obama think he transcends race. They find that appealing. They love the, they embrace the notion that we don't have to talk about it anymore. Interestingly enough, he doesn't think that. I asked him that. He doesn't believe that you can transcend race. And I'm not sure, as I said in my talk, that we need to. I don't think there's anything unhealthy about continuing to have this conversation and continuing to understand that there are differences, but they're not differences that have to be hostile differences. They're not differences that have to, be, that have to end in, in violence and conflict. But if we, don't, if we stop making the effort to understand what the differences are and value what those differences are instead of dismissing them as not important, I think we will miss an opportunity to grow as a nation. I really do. Oh, you're so shy all of a sudden. Yes, sir. <coughs> Oh, thank you. No, I haven't. But if you'd like to ask me a question about Condoleezza Rice, I. Where is her career headed in 08? Do you think she's going to run for president? Is that what you're asking? Really? Oh, I don't think she thinks that. Um, I think Condoleezza Rice is exactly as she appears, which is to say, she is a brilliant woman who is committed to a cause and to the president she serves. I also think that if she were not a black woman, people wouldn't be so surprised at that. Um, for some reason, it's OK for a white male to be completely blindly loyal, say Karl Rove, to someone he serves. But for a black woman, even if her expertise is, is not politics but foreign policy, uh, that for, for questions to be raised about why would she be loyal, she's supposed to be something else. I, I don't think she is, I believe her, I take her at her word when she says she's not interested in elective politics. I think that she is most comfortable in an academic environment and would long to return to one. I think after these past eight years, if I were her, I'd want to. Um, it has not been easy, and whether you agree with the conclusions she's reached and that she's supported or not, she's been in a difficult position. Well, I want to get somebody who hasn't asked one, if that's okay. Yes. What about moving up to the primaries? Is that going to change? Are we going to now have primaries early, or earlier than every quarter? I mean, are you going to be reporting on primaries in the next couple of months? I'm so tired thinking about it. I'm so tired thinking about the primaries. Well, it looks like it's all going to be over by early February, the way it's now scheduled. I, the, the interesting thing is when all the states started playing leapfrog with each other, trying to have the first primary or the earlier primary, I remember hearing someone from Des Moines or Manchester, New Hampshire say, we'll have our primary at Halloween if that's what it takes. And we all went, oh no, the holidays are ruined. The truth is I really think there is a real possibility for it to be okay that the primaries are early. It means that there will be a compressed, very intense period, and then a, 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 and then a little slog in the middle between February and the conventions. We have to get used to the idea, perhaps, that it's different. But that's why so many states like California are rushing theirs forward, because they, they want to be less beside the point by the time the primary gets to them. I, 
you know, I, I can't really can't kind of decide for myself if it's good or bad to have it that compressed. I do think that anything that makes us pay attention in kind of a fierce and focused way is good for democracy. And I, the only problem is if it means that people who are good and worthy and maybe underfinanced candidates can't get heard in all the cacophony of the rush up to early primaries, that we will miss the opportunity to have the best and the brightest serve. Thank you all very much. This is very stimulating. Thank you.